So welcome to the University of Oxford fine-tuning conversation on dark matter. I'm Professor Justin Reed from the University of Surrey uh, and I work on astrophysical probes of dark matter, so trying to understand dark matter through its gravitational influence. And I'm Céline Boehm, a professor at Durham University and I'm an expert in dark matter from the particle physics side and cosmology side. So, Justin, maybe you can uh, remind us what are the evidence for dark matter in terms of, I mean, cosmological evidence. Well, that's right. So, so, so far, we only know about dark matter, as you know, through its gravitational effect. And that's how it was first discovered, um, by looking at the velocities of galaxies moving in giant clusters of galaxies and by looking at the rotation of stars and gas inside uh, galactic disks. Um, and in both cases, these velocities seem to be too high that if you think of galaxy disks, for example, they seem to be spinning uh, very, very fast, uh, and the rate at which they're spinning requires a very strong gravitational force to hold them together to keep them in equilibrium. And that gravitational force is just much larger than what you would expect uh, based on the stars and gas that you see in these galaxies. Uh, and this is typically interpreted as a, a missing mass component, and since we don't know what this is, we call it dark matter. Um, that's the classical evidence, but there are now also a host of other evidences uh, from the bending of space and time around what we call gravitational lenses to uh, our cosmological model, the formation of the whole universe itself. And in every one of these places, wherever we look, we see the need for this same missing or dark matter. So, so do you know any candidates which could explain it? <laughs> well, so this is more, more your area of expertise, but what I will say uh, from the astrophysics side is that uh, we have now mounting evidence um, <coughs> that dark matter, whatever it is, it's something exotic, and it's probably some new particle uh, of nature that lies beyond the standard model of particle physics. And I think there's, well, there are several pieces of evidence for that, but the two strongest ones for me are what we call the cosmic microwave background radiation. This is the afterglow of the Big Bang. So when the universe was around about 400,000 years old, uh, it expanded and cooled, and for the first time it became transparent to photons of light. So these will have streamed out across the whole universe, and we can see them today in the microwave part of the electromagnetic spectrum. So in fact, if you, if you have one of those old TV sets and you detune it between two channels, a few percent of the white noise is actually some of these photons from the very beginning of the universe. And what's uh, fascinating about these photons is that they have tiny ripples in their temperature across the sky uh, at the level of about one part in 100,000. Uh, and those tiny temperature ripples give us a snapshot of what the universe looked like when it was so young. Um, and to get the universe to look that way, to get it to grow that fast and to have that distribution of fluctuations seems to require uh, not just dark matter, but a particularly exotic kind of dark matter, some sort of substance that collapses under gravity but doesn't interact with photons of light across the whole electromagnetic spectrum. Uh, and, and for me, this is very compelling evidence for not just dark matter, but what we call particulate dark matter. Um, and I think, uh, it, it, you know, you're one of the world experts on particulate dark matter and the different candidates, so it would be great if you can summarise quickly some of the, your favourite candidates uh, and what, uh, what the prospects are for finding them. My favourite candidate is actually not the one everybody likes, <laughs> so I will start maybe with uh, the one everybody uh, at least thought we would uh, eventually discover, which is uh, the supersymmetric, uh, supersymmetric candidate called the Neutralino. And supersymmetry is, a, is a, actually is a framework which is extremely large, but it's a beautiful framework which tries to unify different aspects of uh, particle physics. And in particular, tries to understand why uh, we only see particles with certain uh, properties so far, while actually they seem to have a mass which is due to a particle with different properties. So what acquire, I mean, the way uh, particles acquire their mass is due to the Higgs boson. The Higgs boson is a particle without spin, with quantum notion. And all the other particles have a spin. And the question is, is the Higgs boson special because it doesn't have a spin and is the only one? Are there many other particles without spin, like the Higgs boson, and so on? But we, why, if they exist, why don't we discover them? So in this framework, supersymmetry, which tried to explain a uh, possible relation between uh, uh, what we call the fermions, so the particle with spin, and the bosons, particle, for example, without a spin, uh, there is this uh, category uh, of theory where, I mean, where you have a connection between, a natural connection between the fermion and boson. 
is called supersymmetry, but uh, this theory is very particular in the sense that it predicts a lot of new particles. And the lightest one is also supposedly uh, stable. So in principle, this particle should exist nowadays. We should see it. Um, the problem is that uh, there is a question of definition. How do you see a particle? And in principle, we see particles because they emit light. And we see them because of their charge, electrical charge. But for being a dark matter candidate, the particle needs not to have a charge. So the question is, uh, in, in that case, uh, the lightest particle, does it have a charge or not? And it turns out that naturally it doesn't have one. So it seems perfect in the sense that you, you have a theory which predicts a light particle which doesn't have a charge, so would be invisible and could in principle be a dark particle. The question is whether this particle exists or not. And for that, you need to obviously carry a number of experiments. Uh, these experiments so far have been uh, typically the experiments at LHC, uh, at CERN, in Geneva. And they haven't found something called a neutralino, so the, the light test supersymmetric particle. Uh, but they're still looking. And so everybody bets the dark matter is made of neutralino, but uh, we'll see if. Uh, who is right and who is wrong, um, it's clear that if we don't find the neutralino, it's a major change of paradigm because this means supersymmetry may not be correct. And in this case, we will need to understand what else can explain the dark matter. So in personally, my, uh, my alternative for supersymmetry would be a particle which, um, which is um, actually a bit different. It would still be neutral, so that you don't see it. But unlike supersymmetry, which predict that all particles should be fairly heavy, uh, I think dark matter m could be much lighter. And by lighter, I mean instead of being heavier than a proton, I mean actually so light that it could be even lighter than, than an electron. And um, one typical candidate could be a particle called a sterile neutrino, which is essentially like the particle that we have in the standard model of particle physics. The neutrino is actually the most elusive particle of a standard model. It's a neutral particle. It has very weak interactions. It's very difficult to catch, but we know it exists. And we used to think that the neutrino doesn't have a mass. We now know that it's not true. It has a mass, but we don't know how it, qu it can acquire a mass. And unlike all the other particles which have a natural connection with the Higgs boson, the neutrino doesn't, or at least not an abuse one. So we believe that maybe the mass is related to some process in which you have another type of neutrinos, uh, which uh, would interact even less than the neutrinos, and those are called sterile neutrinos. And they would be perfect dark matter candidates, but they would have a mass which is basically thousand, I mean, they would be thousand times lighter than a, an electron. So, so you've mentioned two very popular candidates, the WIMPs and sterile neutrinos, WIMPs being the neutralino. Uh, as you called it then. So one would take us down the path of supersymmetry, uh, which is one extension to the uh, standard model of particle physics, and the other one would be perhaps more of an addendum to the standard model, completing the neutrino sector, which is sort of bizarrely left-handed at the moment. And both, I think, you know, I find very appealing. Uh, and both have, as you know, uh, experiments out there looking for them, underground, deep underground, trying to directly detect these particles, trying to make some at the Large Hadron Collider, in the case of the neutralino, um, and then looking for signatures from space, either in gamma rays for neutralinos or X-rays for sterile neutrinos. And at the moment, there's been no unambiguous smoking gun signature. I mean, every year there's another claim, but then when people look more carefully, it turns out to be something else, background noise, astrophysical sources, uh, a blip in the detector that, uh, that disappears with more data. So uh, at what point? might we start to move away from those sort of two popular models? At what point will people say, it's looking unlikely? Or do you think there's no end? We just keep going? For, because well, so, so it depends, obviously, of uh, the future findings. But in the case of supersymmetry, uh, the supersymmetry predicts the neutrino, as I say, plus a bunch of charged particles. And they may be actually so heavy that they, we have no chance to detect them. Um, but currently, people still hope that we can detect them. And in that case, even if we were not saying the neutralino directly, but we had evidence for charge, new charged particles at LHE or in the other experiments you mentioned, 
then that would be you know, the moment where everybody would actually start to really take uh, supersymmetry very seriously again. Now, it could be that we don't detect anything new at LHC, and then there is a question of fine-tuning, because you could always explain why you don't see anything at LHC by the fact that um, maybe the particles are so uh, close in mass that they're extremely hard to distinguish when you produce collision at LHC, and maybe you cannot analyze the data to a level that is re required to see them, to discover them. That's a, a possibility which... Um, Theoreticians try to uh, quantify, and I would say that it's probably the worst case because you would not know if just the theory is faulty or it just the experimental, I mean, the experimental setup is not good enough. Uh, it's clear that there would always be people trying to push uh, for actually testing a theory, even if it looks completely excluded, or you know the chances of discovery uh, are very small. I'm sure people would still support it. On the other hand, it's clear that uh, at, um, at the end of LHC, or maybe in the next three, four years, if you still don't see any new charged particles, it's clear that a lot of people will start to think that we took the wrong path, and we may have taken the wrong path. Now, if we look at the very light particles, then it's a little bit different, because uh, sterile neutrinos, for example, they are not supposed to come with a bunch of charged particles. So it's a different game, it's a different technique to observe them. Um, and I would say that as long as we know that neutrinos have a mass, we will have to find the mechanism for giving them mass. So we don't have this issue of, you know, when do you abandon, because you know that there is something to explain here, and you, you know they have a mass, you just need to find a compelling uh, mechanism to explain their mass. So it's great that you segued into fine-tuning there, and you mentioned one kind of fine-tuning, which is really interesting, which is you could, you know, hide the production of dark matter in the Large Hadron Collider uh, by, by basically giving the particle a mass very similar to one of the ones we've already got and therefore, you know, literally hiding it within the data. Um, but, of course, supersymmetry was in part invented in the first place to solve fine-tuning problems in the standard model. Um, at a motivation. We can, we can debate this as well, of course. Um, and, uh, but, you know, does it do that? Does it solve those fine-tuning problems if we bury a particle next to another one in, in, in mass or if we push the particle mass to very, very high mass so that there's enormous gap between the appearance of, uh, of a dark matter particle at a given mass scale and the rest of the standard model? Um, and, and similarly, if we decide that SUSY is not the way to go, so supersymmetry was a dead end, uh, and we favor the sterile neutrino, the sterile neutrino has all sorts of wonderful motivations and, of course, there's no reason why the universe can't give us both. We could have a sterile neutrino and supersymmetry. But if we only have the sterile neutrino, what does, you know, where does that take us for fine-tuning problems with the standard model again? They are still there, presumably. Yeah, so, in, so again, in terms of supersymmetry, I think um, not only you didn't solve the initial problem, which was uh, basically explaining, uh, I mean, basically what you, what you saw, we, we basically can't do it in an easy way because we know that all the ingredients that you require to explain, for example, the mass of the top and so on, um, all of those things uh, are more or less excluded. Uh, I mean, the original reasons why you introduce supersymmetry are actually excluded uh, by the experimental findings. Uh, and as people have progressed, they actually added more fine-tuning because now you, you need to be in a parameter space. You need to be in a place where uh, you do strange things to the theory in order to explain... So to interject there, just for, just for clarity, so, so you're, you're saying that where the Large Hadron Collider results are right now, we're already in this new world, basically, where even if we find supersymmetry tomorrow, it will need to be somewhat fine-tuned. Absolutely. No, I, I, I don't think there is any way we can avoid fine-tuning in supersymmetry. Uh, because basically the, the parameter space, which was easy to find without fine-tuning, has been excluded. And so now the only way, for example, you can have a, a good neutral, you know, a good candidate for dark matter is to uh, have it uh, weak, very weakly interacting and very massive, which actually push you in a corner of a theory where you need to, uh, so if we assume, sorry, if we assume that it has uh, the observed density that we see in the universe, then it push you, pushes you in a, in a corner of a parameter space where you do have a lot of fine tuning it will not be uh, the natural solution that you would have thought about you know, 15, 30 years ago. 
So you're already you know, in, a, in a range which is, in a sense, dangerous for the ferry. On the other hand, if you look at the standard model itself, uh, it, the parameters that you, you have are not necessarily natural. So there is a question of, you know, at what stage do you, do you consider that the fine-tuning problem is a problem? Maybe it's just nature has decided that um, you must be in this corner of parameters where masses are pretty similar or where couplings have this value that you don't understand. Um, maybe nature does that. Or maybe we should actually consider that now we have to do so many tricks to the ferry to make it work, but maybe it's, it's a wrong ferry. Unfortunately, we don't have a good piste 